All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our faculty spotlight lecture with Dr. Charlene Niemi. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first off, uh, a brief introduction of Dr. Charlene's uh, uh, work and experience. Uh, Dr. Niemi has vast experience in multiple public and community settings that include school health, correctional health, base-based nursing, and public health nursing. Her research focuses on health literacy and social determinants of health, stigma in family members of those incarcerated, and childhood trauma and well being. Her PhD in nursing is from Azusa Pacific University, with a dissertation on the role forgiveness has on the psychological well being of men who had been abused by priests as children. An important aspect of her life involves community outreach, where she's the director of health education and on the board of directors of Care, Har Care Harbor, a mega clinical that provides free medical, dental, and visual care in a large metropolitan city. Dr. Niemi is a recipient of the Daisy Faculty Award and Emeritus Faculty Member at California State University, Channel Islands. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Niemi, go ahead and take it away. I, I, this is a picture of myself and my husband. I could not have gone through my PhD or my graduate degree uh, without his help and support. So I thought that he he deserves a, a place on the first page of the PowerPoint. That's amazing. That's so cool. Um, I didn't put a lot of writing in my PowerPoint, just kind of headings to kind of keep me focused. So if you have any questions as I move along, please feel free to ask and just put them in the chat. Or if you have any questions, you know, just kind of interrupt me. So. Uh, sorry. Uh, first, I thought I would start with my family. Uh, these are our two dogs. Uh, I have two sons and their girlfriends. Uh, and that is uh, two years ago. The Doberman right now is twice the size of our other one. He, we have a doggy daycare, which I also have a picture of in the end. But, uh, so he was a doctor's dog from UCLA. Actually, she works in the ED. And he was very hyper, and so she didn't want him anymore, so we adopted him. And so he's a, oh, he thinks he's a lap dog. He's like 100 pounds. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's like really heavy. <laughs> I thought I'd start with my work experience. I did not get into nursing thinking that I would even consider getting my PhD. So I, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but I wanted to be an emergency room nurse. My mother was an emergency room nurse, and so that was my focus. Focus when I started nursing school. My last semester was in public health. And so I fell in love with preventative, you know, primary prevention and, and seeing people on their own terms where they live and not under the umbrella of a hospital setting where, where everything is controlled. They eat when meals are so served. Uh, we give them the medication. I, I'd much rather have to get to know them more on a more personal level. I was a new grad when I went to LA County Public Health as a public health nurse, and I had less than a year of experience when the Northridge earthquake quit it. And so that really formed my, my viewpoint on what uh, social determinants of health are and everything like that. Uh, I am a credentialed K through 12 school nurse as well. I have a lifetime credential in that. I have worked K through 12. I have loads of experience in that, and I use that a lot of stories. What we find now, as you know, and have heard in the news, is the rate of depression and anxiety with that population. And so that makes it very difficult. So all of my experience as a public health nurse and as a psychiatric nurse as well, play, give me guidance on how to deal with, uh, with adolescents and young kids as well. My first job was actually at Camarillo State Hospital, where I ended up working and retiring from Cal State Channel Islands, which is where that's. Um, and so it's kind of cool when I taught psych, I would take them on tours of the university as if it were a psychiatric hospital. I knew the layout of it. I was there for a few years. And so it was kind of fun to take students and explore the old Camarillo State Hospital, something that the university does not like to be talked about. So there's all <laughs> kinds of stories that go along with that. I've been a correctional health nurse as well, working for a county jail. I left that because I found 
I, I began to think that everybody was bad in the world mm. and they're not. Yeah. And so we had some pretty high power cases when I was in correctional health, but I just, I just had to leave because it was very, very difficult to kind of be involved with. And then I've also been a college nurse. I was a college nurse for a very small college up in Santa Paula, just a couple hours a week. And I did that through my PhD and my uh, master's degree as well, because the hours were just very flexible. They were very um, accommodating with my school schedule. How did I end up at UCLA? Um, I, <laughs> I congratulate you for, for applying and getting in. Good for you. I never thought I was bright enough to, to, to go here, no less teach here. But as I have been here for a little while, I, I definitely was and so, and still am. And so I do deserve to be here. I've had a great career. I think my problem was that I, I didn't do very well in high school. And so that was, that yeah. was probably the, the main reason why I didn't apply. <laughs> But I got into academia. I called to talk to my friend that was uh, working at Mount St. Mary's College, which is where my undergrad and graduate degrees are from. And the, the uh, chair picked up the uh, phone call and she asked me if I wanted to teach psych and public health at Mount St. Mary's College. And so I fell into it by chance. And I have kind of always basculated. Hi, come, come on in, you get a, a spotlight. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess it would depend upon what you're looking for. Spotlight. We saw, we saw the, the flyer. What is it? Faculty spotlight. This is a spotlight. Yeah, 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 come on in. Yeah, come on in. Yeah, this is the place. This is the place. Yeah, grab a seat. Don't feel bad. Yeah, tell him to come in. Are y'all going? No. Are you in a PhD or DMP? No, uh, SMP. Is it for oh, SMP? Yeah, for everyone. It's for everyone. Yeah. I'm not sure what exactly it is. It's for it's for everyone. It's, all right. it's, it's for an everyone. open lecture by our faculty. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm Dr. Nimi. I'm Danielle. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes, Wait, just, nice you said no, just we got snacks over there. there. We we all got, have this idea, like, am I good enough? Right. No, like. I've also right. had some gap in my work, which I just dedicated to motherhood. And then like, I felt so much like, am I good enough to do this? Like, mm. like the competition of you have to be like all the yes. time, you know, it's, it's very draining. So when I just stop and say, I am what I am and this is enough. It no, is it's enough. Right now I'm doing uh, geriatrics clinical and they're, they're new. It's like only their second quarter that they've been in. And so yesterday I had to pull them all out of the unit for something that occurred, but I had them practice. I deserve to be here because right. they don't think they do. And it's like, you do, you deserve to be here. I deserve to be here. We've worked hard, right? right? Yes. Agreed? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that this title of being at UCLA has this mystic kind of thing about it that you have to be a, a massive grant writer or, and I think that's why I never really applied to work here, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I do deserve to be here and I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for being here. <laughs> but that's how I ended up being at UCLA. So, and that's how we all end up being anywhere. We all have our own history on how, on how we got here. And each of us brings worth to this place. Mm -hmm. I, and I think we all need to, to remember that, so. Oh, I'm clicking my, I think I never used Zoom. Path to PhD. So I don't, when I do my PowerPoints in class, I don't do a lot of writing because I think why people can just read it. Why do I need to be there? So I just do a little snippet. <laughs> um, path to PhD. So I was, I was the lead. Mm, let me kind of go back. I was one of the first faculty at California State University Channel Islands. It was a new nursing program when I started. And so there were only five faculty at the time there. There's still only probably maybe three uh, tenure track faculty there. So it's always been very small. I developed the public health course and the uh, psychiatric, the mental health uh, nursing course. And we were, all of us were pretty much lecturers. And I knew I wanted to retire from there. I wanted to, it was five minutes from my home. It was, I worked there when it was a psychiatric hospital. 
And so I thought to actually be able to stay, I needed to go for my PhD. And so my chair at the time, uh, Dr. Karen Jensen, whose PhD is from here, actually, she was one of my undergrad professors. She waited to post the position until I finished my PhD, oh, which wow. was really, really That's sweet of her. Nice. So, um, which was very, very kind of her. So, and she was one of my undergrad professors. So that relationship that you, we develop with our professors, you know, I'm still friends with her. We still meet for breakfast once a month. I'm still friends with my PhD committee chair. And so that, and I don't think students realize that, is that it is a, I don't know, it's a profession where practice discipline, as I'm sure you know, as an FMP and you're going for your DMP, right? So, so you know, just that. So. Asked my PhD was that I wanted I got my PhD because I wanted to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing fancy. <laughs> oh, let me kind of go back. Um, what I found was I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I uh, girlfriend of mine was going to Azusa Pacific. Uh, she talked me into going. I, in turn, talked another friend into going. And so all three of us went for our PhD at Azusa Pacific. Long commute because we're from Ventura County. And so we all drove together. It was a blast. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do for my PhD. And at that time, we were, I am Catholic. And at the time, the Boston Globe, I was in Boston at the time, and the Boston Globe came out with the sexual abuse by Catholic priests. Right. And so, and I decided that that's what I wanted to tackle. And so, and that's what I did. And I will go into kind of a great bigger detail on that because I found myself going through this very kind of dark night of my soul, you know, as I was doing this research because just the same reason why I had to leave correctional health nursing because, you know, everybody was bad there, you know, so-called in quotes bad, but to deal in abuse and meet with these men and hear stories from their families and hear their stories. Uh, one man, I had to actually talk to him on the phone for about an hour before he even agreed to do my quantitative study, just so he could trust me in, in you know, that I wasn't going to uh, kind of do him any harm with that. So it's very hard. It was very, very difficult. It was very, very difficult. So, um, but I am glad that I did it. And I have met some lifelong friends in doing that. And I know they say when you go into research, you shouldn't, you know, have to be careful because I had to maintain those boundaries of being a researcher at the same time. And then also, but that subject matter almost required to get to know some of these victims and whatnot. So, but because it was quantitative, I had to, it was tough. It was really tough to find participant subjects uh, in that in that matter. So, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, go ahead. It's it's so hard to, to to be close up to such trauma. Did you have any kind of like professional support to help you, like your own therapist or like supervision? Good question. Or yeah, that's because a good I question. know how. Because I do interpersonal psychotherapy and I don't deal with trauma and just like these small things, challenges and patients' life can be so hard on me to process. So I can't imagine how hard it would have been for you to you know. Be able to take on all this emotional load and live with it for I don't know how many months. Well, it's kind of interesting. So when I was getting ready for this presentation, I read through my dissertation. Oh wow! And so just so I kind of refresh myself on what on what it was about, but it was hard to reread it. Um, at the end of the dissertation, there's probably four or five stories that uh, men wanted me to share in the dissertation. So, and join us. Uh, um, and so, yes, it was very hard. So I have a very tight group of friends that were a huge help throughout all of it. Uh, my husband was a huge support. So yes, yeah, I had I had support. So which is, and I tend to always go for, oh, maybe it's all my psych work and my public health work, but I kind of, you know, so I've done research on family members of the incarcerated. I've done research on survivors of, you know, ACE. So I've always kind of been towards that population, I guess. You know, I've never really been interested in respiratory diseases right. or 
you know, I'm sorry if that's, you know. <laughs> I guess I like getting down nitty and gritty on what's really, and, and if you think about it, right, this, you know, child sexual abuse, the AIDS is, a lot of times that's the reason for all of the medical issues that we see, right? And all of the inpatient psych issues yeah. and, and, you know, the cancers and everything like that. So, yeah. so it kind of, it all ties in. Right. Right. If anybody on Zoom has any questions, please uh, go ahead and let us know. Um, again, here are the studies that I've done, meaning in life and forgiveness. Do they improve the quality of life in adults? That had to do with uh, ACEs. I did that test. All of these are quantitative. As you can tell, I love to talk. And so people were shocked that I wanted to do quantitative and not qualitative. But when I was doing my research classes, I fell in love with the numbers, which kind of was a shock. The second one, I never thought I would see you and not be able to touch you. That title came from, we were visiting a friend in LA County Men's Central Jail. And I was talking to a visitor there. He was actually a, a pastor that came to visit some of the inmates that he had met because he had actually been there as a, an inmate. And I was telling him about my study and he, he, he told me the story is that when his parents first came to visit him, he was so worried about seeing his mom when he was in jail, but it was his dad that broke his heart. And his dad told him, I never thought I would see you and not be able to touch you. Because when you visit somebody that's incarcerated, you're behind a glass window, right? And you pick up a phone, like an old fashioned pay phone almost, right? And so there's no human contact at all when you're visiting somebody in a county jail. And so for me that, what he told me really rang true. And so this study is based on if I, as a parent, do I have an adult child that's incarcerated? If I'm an adult child, do I have a parent that's incarcerated? And what is that affiliated stigma of me having that person um, that's incarcerated? Affiliated stigma, meaning that I'm not the one in jail. I'm not the one that has a disability. I'm not the one you know, who experiences that, but I am connected to that person. And, um, and so that's what affiliated stigma means. And there is no research on this at all. There's been a lot of research on kids and how kids are affected, but there's no research on adults and how they're affected. And so I have uh, over a hundred, um, I did, I went to, I got approval to go to LA County Men Central Jail. I actually got, to, I had nursing students from Channel Islands. Uh, we didn't have a, a graduate degree at the time. So, so I taught research at Channel Islands and when I would talk about what I wanted to do, they were so excited and asked to join my research studies. And so I had two or three students help me with this. We went to Ventura County Jail waiting room. We got approval for there. And then also uh, Men's Central Jail in Los Angeles, which is the largest psychiatric facility in the world and the highest in number of inmates in the country. Wait, wait, is that? LA County, uh, Men's Central Jail. Oh, that's Twin Towers. So, it, yeah, uh, so downtown. You can see Men's them when you're jail, right? Yes. Right. Men's Central Jail. So I talked to family members. So, so I looked at length of time. Were they in prison? Were they in county jail? We have so many people that are incarcerated in this state. It's, it's unbelievable. What was the crime? How did these family members cope? What did they use to cope? and what kind of stigma do they carry? And as you can imagine, the more, like the more um, harsher crimes, I guess, the more that affiliated stigma, mm -hmm. you know, occurs. Uh, people that, that have a loved one that's in for any type of sexual misconduct, they have a lot of stigma as well, affiliated stigma. And then obviously this last one is my uh, dissertation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Just going back a little on um, your work with uh, inmates, um, did you find any like um, specific aspects to that experience or the stigma that the family members experience based on any racial differences? Like how it would manifest on like folks of color versus non-people of color? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't. 
What I found was interesting enough is that those social determinants of health, as we know in the medical field, they really determine how, what kind of care we're able to, to get, right? So I have health insurance. And so I'm able to pick my doctors that I go to. I'm, I have the transportation to drive to them. I have a good education. But what I found with family members that were visiting loved ones in the Men's Central Jail and also in Ventura County is that I would give, I had like a raffle to get people to participate. And people that they want to visit their family members, but they can't because they don't have the money to, to visit. Yeah because of the social determinants of health, right? And so that's where I found the discrepancies, mm. is those social determinants of health. Wow. Do they have the money to pay for a good attorney? Right. Right. Did they have money to kind of help, you know, a child that may have mental illness, you know, or, in, you know, that kind of thing, substance abuse? That's where the social determinants, that's where the racism comes, mm. comes into it. Good, good. That's very so, interesting, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my current endeavor is, I, I, I'm really glad that um, I am doing this because as I was going through my research studies, I hate to write. Uh, I think as we all do, I don't know about people that are online, but I hate to write. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it really made me kind of like going, I want to get back into doing research. And so thank you for having me because it really kind of sparked my interest. Oh, that's um, awesome. Again, I already have something in mind that I want to do. Yeah. So, but I'll tell you at the end because everyone's going to think I'm just really weird. <laughs> uh, but right now I have been asked to uh, co-author a community health public health textbook. It's rector textbook. It's in the 11th edition. Uh, Dr. Rector has retired. And so I helped with the 10th edition. So they were... Uh, I was privileged enough to be asked to be brought in as one of the authors of that textbook. So I'm one of the editors. I just finished three chapters of that textbook, one on violence, one on behavioral health, obviously, and one on uh, disability health. And then I am editing um, half the textbook. What I find is that here's this idea of are we worth it to be here? Mm. Is that when I look at the authors of the ch chapters for this textbook, I am blown away. I am humbled thinking I, I do not deserve to be looking at your work because wow. you are amazing. Um, but uh, again, there's that idea that obviously I, I am worth it because I'm, I'm, I'm here, right? Uh, and so that's been going well. We hope to come back. The textbook should come out uh, late 2024, early 25. And then also with the same author that I'm doing that, Book, we are doing a nursing education textbook for nurse educators on, on what's it like to teach. As I fell into teaching, I didn't plan on it, right? I called to talk to my friend at Mount St. Mary's College. The chair of the department picked up and said, we need faculty. Do you want to teach? And I was like, wow, sure, why not? Nice. And so this textbook will be for educators, hospital educators, faculty educators, just kind of give them an idea on how to teach. How do we align objectives with learning activities? How do we bring in the AAC and essentials? Also with the textbook that we're writing, we're doing something that no other textbook is doing is that we are, all of the chapter objectives tie into the AAC and essentials. And then, um, and the essentials are listed based on those objectives. And then we have learning activities so that students can show the competencies related to that objective or the AAC and essential. So, so we're very proud of it. We're working really hard. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, good. And you also like um, uh, work with the code of ethics of nursing because like throughout my experience in education, it's been very underlooked. Like it's just this book on the side that you know, no one like <laughs> looks at. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was wondering like, if you put this in your- We do, we have, yeah. we have. Yeah. Um, yes, we do. I think I asked, you know, most of us, I think, are faculty on this, but I asked a, a student that I currently have, why did you go into nursing? What had you go into nursing? And she gave me an answer that I had never heard before. People say, I want to help people. People will say it's the money. And she says, I want to give meaning 
to my patients. Mm. I was blown away. And how can I, how can we give meaning to a patient that's in a hospital bed? Right. You know, so we talked about the ethics of that and how do we, and we do that by providing good care, right? Yeah, it's not true. So, and that's the ethics of nursing. But ethics in public health is even greater because, you know, social determinants of health, preventative health care, primary prevention, all of that has to do with the ethics of nursing. I tell my students, I don't, I want to keep patients out of the hospital. And, and so how do we do that? Right. So currently I'm doing a clinical for a public health rotation and, you know, it's all about partnerships. It's all about meeting people and that human connection, right? Which is so important. And so we, uh, I walk students, it's about two miles. I walk them to Western Bagel, the factories there in Van Nuys. We walk up Sepulveda Boulevard and they always come out and talk to us every class that I take out there. Well, this time they give us a tour and it's because of that partnership. And they haven't done tours in probably five or six years. Oh, wow. And it was awesome. It was so great because we talk about occupational health, you know, standing and it, that's been there from 1947. Generations have worked there. It's been owned by the same family for generations, which is really cool. You so, already have somebody interested in a book copy and a desk copy for your book. <laughs> yeah, it? It's a Kia's crying Jeffers. Aww. He says, would love to get a desk copy of the book when it's out to consider uh, for the N171 course. Ooh, there you go. See? <laughs> That's a plug in already. <laughs> nice plug thank in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then my my love of my life is Care Harbor. I think, you know, getting back to ethics and social determinants self is that we have to do community service that we don't get paid for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to give, right? Yeah. To give back. Yeah. Right? I am worth it. How do I give back? And so I am on the board, just got voted in on the board of directors of Care Harbor, uh, so which I'm very excited about. And I am... Yay. I, yeah, yeah. It's really exciting. It's really exciting. And then... I put together, Care Harbor treats about a thousand people over the course of three days. They provide free medical, dental, and vision care to uh, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, it's a massive event and they didn't have any patient education. And so another study that I did was on the health literacy of that population. And they're about third grade level if people can read it all. And so, how do we educate patients? You know, a hospital setting, we give all this wonderful education, but people are scared, they wanna go home, they don't remember anything that's said. You know, I'm always asking my students, what does that mean, what does that mean, what does that mean as they use these medical terms that patients don't know? And so, like, get it down to where a kid can understand it, then you can talk, then you can find out what the person really knows and about teach back and whatnot. And so I developed with grants from the CDC and AACN on developing a health education for Care Harbor. And so far, I've probably had anywhere from five to 600 students do that with me over the years that I've done that. So, and we are looking that, to take that to others, um, other states now. And so that sustainability is so important in, in public health. But that's my, that's my baby. Nice. Um, here is a picture Amazing. of Care Harbor. Um, the past two events have been more focused. So we did one on veterans and people that are uh, unsheltered. And this time we're doing maternal child health. And so I have a, a DMP student actually from Rush University with Susan Schweider, who was part of our team here to help us meet the public health AAC and essentials. It's like one of those authors that's in our textbook that I'm just like, I do not, I'm just a little peon in this big wheel. Um, and we have all these awesome people that are writing for this textbook. But uh, she reached out to me because she knows my work with Care Harbor and she also is one of our authors uh, in this textbook. And so I have her, one of her DMP students from Rush University who will help me at Care Harbor this year. But, uh, the woman lives in LA. So, but this is, they'll have anywhere from about 35 to 50 dental chairs. We have medical providers. We have, they make classes there and we do health education for all three areas. And I bring nursing students and they have to be seniors. Mm -hmm. They can't be new grads. I mean, uh, 
you know, freshmen or sophomores, then they have to be baccalaureate or above. Because they have to have all of the disciplines, all the specialties taught. You know, to answer questions. To answer questions, yeah, right, exactly. So, so that's kind of my, my big guys. I love that picture. Yeah, and that yeah. cool. What location, was, what location was this? Yeah. This was at the sports arena. Oh, nice. Yeah, Very cool. so I mean, they're big. Yeah, they're big. that's really cool. Yes. And you said how many people the program treats? Uh, they, they are open for about three days and they'll see about a thousand people a day. People line wow. up around. Nice. So it's, it's massive. That's so amazing. And they have a, an architect, they have an interior designer. Uh, the architect uh, drew the plans for Cedar sinai and he's done hospitals all over the world. And so, and he used to volunteer and then the CEO of Care Harbor, uh, Don Minnelli, so I, I know his last name is Super Kia. <laughs> <laughs> um, you volunteer for the organization and, and he just draws you in. So just draws you in a really good, uh, a good man. Um, and then I, I showed this for uh, just to kind of tell people that there is life after nursing school. Uh, I started a doggy daycare and uh, with our son and here's one of our dogs. He's our sentry. He's keeping watch at our front door. Oh. And so, uh, so life is good. Yay. <laughs> Life is very good. I love that. So good. Um, and then I teach psych as the, you know, the faculty knows. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the things that I have them do in psych is that nursing is so, we're an art and a science. And I think a lot of us forget about the art aspect of it as you're learning like all the anatomy and physiology and medications and stuff like that. And so my students have to do an art project and they can be, and it's equal to an exam grade, and they hate it when they find <laughs> out about it. Um, <laughs> but man, the art pieces that come out, and it has to relate something to mental health, yeah. something that they've seen in a hospital setting, some disease, some family issue themselves even. And so I picked these two for this PowerPoint because as people graduate, like when you finish your DMP or you finish your FMP, is that that idea of a new beginning. Yeah. You know, there's a new crossing that will take place and we deserve to be here. Right. right? We do. Yeah. Totally. Art, art is a therapy on its own. Oh my gosh, it's huge. I was, a, I do meet the masters in my kids' school. I've learned a lot, but also I was at the Getty the other day and just learned that actually Van Gogh, he did the study night while he was in a mental health facility. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. This art is is, is is a whole. It's therapeutic. Oh yeah, it's therapeutic. And so we open it up to a faculty and staff. It's it's downstairs in the auditorium, and then we close the gallery. It's like in a gallery, and then we close the gallery, and then we come back to class, and people share their art pieces, and then we tie it into social determinants of health, family issues related to. You know, it's like to be a family member of somebody with a mental illness and our patients and just the worry. You know, no one ever wants to do psych uh, when they graduate nursing school, but our patients suffer from anxiety, depression, pain. Families are anxious. There's mental health issues every, everywhere, yeah, right? Yeah. Especially since the pandemic. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's massive. And so this kind of ties in. It's a safe space. I share some of my stories, my personal stories, some of, you know, I share family issues and stuff like that. So there's no secrets in my classes, but this just helps them to, I think, trust me more and really want to open up. And, and there are, the art pieces are just uh, amazing. So, so that's, uh, you know, our journey. Yay. <laughs> Great. Uh, all righty. I know. And yeah. Then gonna go ahead and open it up for questions so if anyone has any questions feel free to go ahead and Sorry. unmute yourselves hi everybody go ahead barb um hi everybody hi charlene this is just so inspiring thank you for being you and sharing all this truly you're welcome um and thank you Juan, for putting this together it's so nice to get to know everybody more i really appreciate it um can you hear me okay yes yeah, thank you. okay great i was like maybe i'm just talking <laughs>
No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I'm thinking about that, but um, wondering what um, your kind of heart space or technique was into getting um, establishing rapport and trust with um, your, you know, sample population, you know, families of incarcerated or people have experienced abuse, because I think it's such an art to really disarm people and feel safe. So that's my first question of if you could speak to that. <laughs> that's a great question. I think for me, one of my students um, in geriatrics uh, told me on Tuesday, because I tell them, you know, I, I start talking to a patient, a lot of times they'll walk away. It's like, no, stay, watch therapeutic communication, watch the interview, motivational interviewing. And she said what she notices about me is that I, I am next to the patient. I don't stand a couple feet away. I am standing with them. And, and I know, and so I, I, I shake their hands. I, I, you know, introduce myself. I, I'll, put down my mask really fast. I do put it right back up just so they can see my face, see me smile, know that I'm not threatening. And I think when I was doing this research, I started with my dissertation. I started with, I am a Catholic. I understand what it's like to be a Catholic. I understand what the priest means to the congregation because, you know, people have said it's a, it's an authority figure, right? And so that, that does carry a different weight. But when you put a priest in the mix that's doing that abuse, the priest represents and is the icon of Christ on earth. That is a completely different level. And some of the men that I spoke with, I mean, they shared these heart-wrenching stories with me, is that it, it broke their soul. It broke their spiritual life. And, and that continued. And it's been coined as these priests as being murderer of souls because all of these men wanted to become priests. The majority of them wanted to become priests. So their families were involved in the church and it just broke them. And, and so, you know, we talked about the dark night of the soul and I went through that as well. And my personality, I mean, it was just, yeah, it was, it was bad. So I think just having an open mind, letting the survivors know that I, that I didn't come to bash them. I didn't come to belittle the church. I didn't, I just came as someone that was really wanting to learn. I didn't want to find out everything that was wrong with them. Enough research has been done on that. I wanted to look at forgiveness and how, if that helped them. And that was a tough battle because a lot of them, you think of forgiveness as, oh, you hurt me? Well, let's be friends anyways. Right, it's right? different than reconciliation. Which people mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, they, and so they, they, they miss is that forgiveness is really for the person that, and that's hard. I mean, I have a girlfriend that I'm still angry with for you know something that I imagined that she did wrong to me, but to be sexually abused as a kid and the parents think, oh my gosh, this priest, he loves my son you know, this is all good. So they, they trust the person, yeah. right? So it's not only, so I use the Newman system model because, you know, it's my nursing theory because the Newman systems model looks at the individual, the family, the community and society, societal issues. And so all of that played huge factor in, in my abuse. There were, the one man told me that the minute he developed pubic care, he was being abused, family downstairs, mom cooking dinner, priest is abusing the kid upstairs, and the priest comes down, and when he could develop pubic care, priest came downstairs, walked out the door, and said to the mom, he's not cut out to be a priest, and walked out. I mean, and these are stories of people that, that opened up to me. I met with parents, I met with wives, it was just, uh, yeah, it was, I traveled all over the country, my poor husband, because I'm not good at writing grants, so my husband and I paid for all of this. Um, I ran newspaper ads in 13 newspapers across the country in areas that had high rates of abuse. Um, so did wow. I answer your question, Barb? Yeah, yeah, thank <laughs> you. I mean, so powerful and and really, you know, such courageous, such like courageous compassion, you know, truly. Um, and 
I, my next question, which might be a little sensitive and again, please That's defer, okay. you know, anything is welcomed, but um, just wondering if that was a challenge as a practicing Catholic with your Catholic congregation to be researching oh. such a, um, you know, controversial subject within the Catholic church. So, yes, it's a good question. Uh, no, my friends, it was kind of, I think my husband went through more of that um, than I did. Uh, I watched Spotlight. Uh, if you haven't seen it, no, is that what it's called? It won an Academy Award several years back and it was on the uh, Boston Globe um, story, but I had to walk out of it because it was just so heart-wrenching to kind of see it visualized. And one of the leads in that uh, became a good friend of mine. He recently passed away from AIDS, but it, we stopped going to church for, for a very long time because of it, actually. So, um, which didn't help my, but everybody, so the church I'm currently going to, a uh, priest can be married. Uh, they all, everybody knows. In fact, he always kind of tells people, you know, do you know what she did her dissertation on? So, um, so yeah, so no, I have not experienced. I've had people say, well, it's not that bad of a problem. It was only in the United States and we know that not to be true. So. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is so inspiring. Thank you for sharing all of that. I want to go back to your experience with the incarcerated people because that brings me back to a very famous study, Philip Zimbardo, the prisoners, and how people can easily, you know, conform to the social roles they expected right. to play. Correct. So your role was actually to try them not to do that. You know, to go beyond that stigma, and you don't have to play that role for the rest of your life. Well, my 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 research on that study was done with the family members, okay. not with the inmates. Yeah, but as so. they role as like the family members of that person, I think like psychologically changes how they view the world. And it's huge. It's huge. Uh, the affiliated stigma, and and what I found when I was doing the research is that it becomes the norm especially when someone's incarcerated for a long period of time, the deputies would buy Christmas presents uh, for the little kids. And on holidays, the little girls would get all dressed up and the little boys would all be wearing suits and stuff to show their dads. Um, I, and so I, you know, you know, I learned some terms that I didn't know before, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I, it's a, It's uh, it sounds weird for me to say this, but when we were in the waiting rooms, you know, uh, trying to talk with people about the study, it becomes a camaraderie. It's like they share we share something in common, right? I share something in common with the people that graduate from Mount St. Mary's for their nursing degree. I share something in common with somebody that has a Ph.D. from Azusa Pacific. They share something in common. And that is. That's the community. That's their sense of community, which we all need. So, yeah, it changes. It changes the whole family dynamics, right? So. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so what made you pursue this type of research in specific? Because you could have taken it any, whichever way you would have liked to, but what made you want to, like, for example, for say your dissertation, like what made you pursue that in specific? I was uh, in Boston at the time of the Boston Globe coming out with all the sexual abuse. Um, at, oh, thank you for asking me that because I have that down in my notes to talk about. So I grew up in Ventura County. Uh, I grew up in Westlake Village. Oxnard. <laughs> Wait, till you have my Wait till you hear my story. Um, yeah, you're not going to like it. <laughs> Just FYI. So. Um, Go Trojans. <laughs> We had a priest when I was growing up there, I, who was sexually, was an abuser. Mm. And so uh, there's a picture of one of the survivors that shows him at our church, the priest, when he was a little kid. And then he, the survivor actually took a picture at the same spot as an adult. That priest was transferred to Oxnard. Oh no. 
So what happened is that the archdiocese, that's where the problem stems from, mm -hmm. right? Is that it's not reported, it's shoved under the rug. And I, when I was doing my dissertation, they, you know, like in the 17th century, in the 1100s, you know, somebody did this, they were castrated, they were thrown out onto the streets, mm -hmm. their families were thrown out into the street. And so in that time period, if you were thrown out, you had no means of support. Yeah. And so now because of, you know, all the, you know, now all the lawyers got involved. And so now everything gets put under the rug. And so what happened with the Archdiocese of LA and across the world is that when a priest was abusing someone in an affluent area, they transferred him to an area that was not affluent oh my God. where people didn't speak up. And so a lot of these priests went from, you know, those priests went from Westlake Village to Oxnard to Santa Paula where English is not the primary language. Wow. And so then that abuse just continues. Wow. That's and that, yeah. And they, and they moved that and they were moving people across the world to even in doing that. So yeah, it was messed up only about 4% of, of priests abused, but there's a couple that abused, you know, there's one priest abused 150 kids. He was actually murdered in jail by a victim of sexual abuse, not by a priest. And then another one, uh, abused uh, about 200 kids. And so, and I knew, I knew men that had been abused by those priests. So. Wow. Good question. Thank you for, for asking that question. Anybody else have questions? And nobody, uh, I will then talk about my future research. I, I doubt I'll get any funding for it though. <laughs> nobody else? Should I ask? Should I ask? Yeah, you can go ahead. All right. So, um, future research, you guys. Yes. So, oh, obviously, I I research odd things. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Something that nobody else likes to do, and I we need someone to do it. So yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to, and I've been a psych nurse for a long time. I've seen some pretty horrific um, illnesses in patients. So I want to do, and I, I, Emma, are you, Dr. Cuenca, are you still on? Yeah, she's here. I know, yeah, I see your face. Still here. Yep, so I don't want you to think I'm not gonna hire this woman. I'm not gonna bring her back when her contract is over when you find out what I want to do for my next study. <laughs> um, I want to research exorcisms. Wow. Um, Interesting. That's my, uh, that's big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't know how to. That's a whole nother lecture. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, obviously, if I, if I have, I do believe, and you guys are going to think, I don't think I'm weird, please. The facts too that are on here, they probably will never want to teach with me. Um, I do think that there are demons that affect people. And I have seen patients that have, that I'm almost positive. Um, and that, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so what, what helps? And I think that is, a, you know, culturally based. Are we open to it as a society? Is nursing as a science ready for that? I don't know how much research has been done on it. I have to be really careful for my own spirituality if I start to dive into that, obviously. But I think that that is, I don't know, I just feel drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Kind of strange on what I like to research. Sounds exciting, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. Very different. So I guess what I'm saying to both of you that are here, and I don't know if any students are on, but is that, you know, as, as researchers, we do have to make sure that we have that wall, that we don't get involved, you know, because if we're involved, that's maybe that's why I liked quantitative research so much, because I do like to talk to people. I like to get to know people and quantitative research kind of stops that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, because it's all online, you know, it's, you know, I use Qualtrics and everything like that. 
There's distance. There's distance. Yes, there's distance. Thank you. Um, I if find something that you're that you're passionate about that you want to do because you know you're going for your DMP. You won't be doing like research, research, but you will be doing the you know studies, right? What are you interested in? You know, yeah, that's a long time. I have a question from Dr. Salem. Hi. Yes. Charlene, um, thank you very much for sharing your pathway um, and your faculty scholarship as well. And, you know, your courage to share you, all of this with us, you know, in terms of exploring your next research topic, I wonder if you've considered the type of design that you would want to use and um, the population as well. Yes. Yes, thank you for that question. I haven't done a lit review yet, so I'm not quite sure the design. Uh, my guess is it might have to be qualitative. Maybe it will have to be a uh, you know, historical kind of research study, maybe a lit review, maybe a concept analysis. I'm not quite sure yet. I haven't. And like I said in the beginning, is that doing this presentation, looking at my research that I've done in the past has inspired me to really work on getting published. Uh, one of my, you know, like when I uh, finished my PhD, I submitted my dissertation, an article for it, and it was turned down. I was crushed and I haven't gone back to it. And, um, but if you were to ask any of the faculty here that have published, it takes time, you know, it takes practice. And so it's really kind of inspired me to, to kind of go back into that again. So, but it's a great question and I, Yes, I have to do a lit review. There's probably not much on it as far as the science goes. So I think one of the biggest challenges is whether you are going to relate this to psychopathology in any way, because you're addressing something very big, which is, you know, the mind versus matter. Yes. Like what is over who or is yes. it something the same? Yes. So it's really big. Like what lens are you going to take? You know, psychopathology or philosophy yes. or you know, like spirituality. It's it's a lot. And to combine all three so together, much. it takes a lot of, you know. Um, and I might, what I might do is actually look at what is the opinion of psychiatric nurses and psychiatrists, right? Because they they might think, well, this is this is like you're weird, yeah. you know. Yeah, there are so well, I also, Charlene, one other thing to consider is actually the perspective of the person, yes. like the patient or client, and that can be um, a specific. For example, like you can develop individual interviews. And then look at it from the provider perspective as well. You're and, talking qualitative. You know, <laughs> I, I am. I am. But I think that exploring exploring perspectives yes. would be really valuable because you can at least understand um, the thought process behind um, the belief systems. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. I'm. I'm taking notes as you're talking. Actually. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this could be a brainstorming session. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. I think, um, Mary, Nancy Joe, did you have a question? You had, you had your hand up. I did. It's not about your new research, but first I want to thank you for sharing. This is the first uh, faculty, um, you know, meeting I've been to, and it was really, really, like uh, Dr. Salem said, uh, very important for us to get to know one another and get to know each of our um, experiences. But I was a little interested in, you've done a research on forgiveness. And I was wondering if you could just speak a minute to the role of forgiveness in mental health and also in relationships or what you found through that research. So my, my dissertation only had 67 participants. And so obviously I was kind of limited because I didn't have that big of a sample size. People were surprised I even got that many. Mm -hmm. But what I found is that, you know, my, my tool for forgiveness looked at meaning, um, sorry, absence of the negative. So I'm no longer angry. I'm no longer holding resentment. And the second domain or subset for that was presence of positive. I've made peace with that person. And I did have men that had developed that level of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So, but what I found was that people that had absence of the negative 
that had that level of forgiveness had um, significant p-values as far as um, autonomy, personal growth, relationships. Uh, there's about seven um, well-being, environmental health. And so they were able to, and some men didn't come to it until they had their own kids. Mm. And they realized that they really need to. And so their mental health improved. And then my one on ACE, I mean, we all know the problems with ACE, but what I found is that, so I use forgiveness and then meaning in life as well for that particular study. Because I think, you know, it's kind of interesting is that student, her reason for becoming a nurse was to provide meaning for her patients. And, you know, I was telling her about my study that I did and looking at meaning in life. Are we able to use our suffering as to help somebody else? Does that suffering provide meaning in our life? And so those that had, you know, a high level of, that were really searching for it and had a high level of meaning in life had much better quality of life overall um, as far as the uh, quality of life tool by the World Health Organization. So it does, it does help. And the interesting part, and in fact, you know, this, a statistician that helped me with my dissertation, the people that had the highest level of forgiveness were those that were abused had the most severe abuse as infants mm. under the age of one. So mm -hmm. it was almost like the more severe the abuse, and that was across the age groups. It's almost as if the worst, the worst form of abuse that people suffered, they had to do something mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had the higher levels of forgiveness, at least absence of negative, which I found very, very interesting. Thank you. That is very interesting. I was, uh, you know, my experiences as an oncology nurse and working with the dying patient, I just had found that it, it appeared that patients who were angry and unable to come to a forgiving state whether that was their personal relationships or something like abuse that had happened to them, had a more difficult time coming to terms yeah. with their dying it's experience. Very, 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 very true. Because mm -hmm. I mean, yes, very, very true. I think that, you know, you know, when I did my dissertation, we all, I mean, there's a set way that it's done, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody sits down, every, the uh, I forgot what they even call it, people that are doing their dissertations, but the person, you know, gives their spiel and the audience asks friends. I had friends come. My group of girlfriends that were so supportive of me during this study, they came. They didn't know the protocol. And uh, the dean of the program came. I had, um, obviously my chair, my committee came. I had students come from all levels. Uh, I had different departments come. The room was full because of the topic. Mm -hmm. And I had professors at APU that did not want me to do this research because they didn't consider forgiveness as a nursing intervention. But it is. It's in the nursing yeah. intervention classification. And so thank God for my chair because she said that's what she wants to do. It's the population that she wants to do it with. And she's going to do it. And so, but what happened, it was almost therapeutic for people that were in the room. Mm -hmm. We had we had people come up to my girlfriends, you know, that talked to them afterwards that they had been abused, you know, as a kid. And so my girlfriend said where they they came in, they brought food, they set up the food. Um, I'm giving my presentation. And in a dissertation, when you're presenting, nobody asks any questions. Uh -huh. My girlfriends are raising their hands during my talk, asking questions. <laughs> I love it. Which, That's which opened the door for everybody to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was perfect. It was perfect. So, but I think the topic plays a huge, huge role in that. Mm -hmm. Huge role. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about such sensitive topics, it's very emotionally. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so how do you contain that at the end of your talk or at the end of the session? Like, how do you manage to make sure people are leaving safely, you know, safe enough, you know? Right. Um, just the importance of finding support, giving them resources. And in my qualitative study, 
every couple slides I had, if you're having a hard time, stop taking the, the test, talk, stop taking the, the call tracks and get some help. And then I had resources. Another question that people had is that, uh, well, especially with my ACE study, is the reporting. So if somebody's admitting abuse, and as nurses, we're mandated reporters, right? And so, so that was a question that the IRB committee had. But when I talked to the chair of IRB, is that we report re abuse when we know where it's happening. This was Qualtrics, it was completely anonymous. There is no way I could have reported it. And so they let it go through. And the same with the clergy sexual abuse as well, so. Thank you for coming. That's so sweet of you. Poor thing, you're just walking by. <laughs> so we're nearing the hour. If anyone has any last minute questions or comments, feel free to drop that now. Oh, uh, I passed. I know. Yeah. It's been a wonderful yeah. one hour here. Uh, great vibe in the room, too. So um, thank you, Dr. Charlene Niemi, for today's uh, faculty spotlight lecture. And uh, uh, just as a quick add, our next uh, faculty spotlight speaker will be Dr. Anita Braylock. So uh, pass around the voice and the messages, and I will see you around. Thank you, Dr. Thank Nini. you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes, thank you. Emma, thank you. Belinda, you said thank you. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. I may say I do receive the funding for.